But if I may start by um, on behalf of, of, of Jaluk, uh, talk about Euros, Europe's place in the global global trade. Uh, it is is a place that has change in a very interesting manner in the past few years. Uh, not that long ago, if you think about it, uh, we will have said that the threats to trade were coming from within the European Union. Uh, we saw protesters in the streets against CETA, against TPP. Uh, we saw politicians, we saw civil society, uh, taking up issue with trade, attacking trade, in some cases for reasons that had to do with trade, in some cases for reasons that had nothing to do with trade. Uh, the Commission did not take the situation lightly. Uh, the pains of globalization and the effects of the financial crisis were real and tangible, and fears were also there. There were fears that Europe will not maintain its policy standards, fears that deals will be concluded without the necessary democratic controls. Um, these realities and fears, to a large extent, were beyond trade policy. But we nevertheless understood uh, and responded by upgrading and making an effort to adapt and explain our trade policy uh, by making a, an effort to make it more transparent, to update our toolbox, and to clearly and unequivocally embedding our standards in our trade agreements. I think the whole work that has been done in the last years on issues such as sustainable development or corporate social responsibility. And our, our objective was and continues to be uh, to ensure that people trust trade uh, because trade in the end, I know is obvious, but I think needs to be repeated often, is an energy for our economy, uh, an opportunity for our businesses and a very fundamental source in Europe for innovation and employment. Nevertheless, these days when we are talking about uh, threats to trade, we are talking about threats that seem to be coming from outside, and the need to reaction uh, is a different one. We need to prove again the importance of our trade policy uh, and the importance of a trade policy based on rules and values and on their respect. Uh, today, in order to address these new threats for trade, we are working on, on three uh, directions. Some of it has already been discussed in the prior panel. We want to maintain uh, the European Union place as one of the main players in the international trade arena. Uh, we want to enforce and defend global rules, and we want to modernize the WTO. Um, as regards the first one, uh, maintaining our place as a main player in international trade, uh, it has not gone unnoticed to you, I am sure, uh, that in the last year we have closed an, un an unusual large amount of trade negotiations. Japan, Singapore, Mexico, Vietnam, uh, you know that there are negotiations ongoing, there are negotiations just launched, like with Australia and New Zealand. Uh, these are probably uh, some of the clear, clearest signs, our clearest uh, proof that we are committed to trade. Uh, if you take our agreement with Japan, for instance, uh, for trade purposes, uh, it was a fast negotiation. And not only in terms of negotiation, also, if you recall, we did agree in principle to the agreement in July 2017. But again, for those of you that follow trade, you know sometimes how long a discussion there is between agreement on principle and conclusion. But we did manage to have the signature of the uh, free trade agreement uh, by a year later. 
uh, and we want to keep that momentum. We are confident that uh, we will be in a position to hopefully with the help of the European Parliament, i.e. the consent of the European Parliament, have the EU-Japan agreement ratified by the end of, of the year. And it was not only the speed, for instance, of, of Japan negotiation that is impressive, it's also what you look, when you look at the content of the agreement. Uh, when this agreement reaches its full potential, 97% of Japanese imports from the EU will be tariff-free. Uh, and the remaining 3% will be partly liberalized through quotas and reductions. Um, the agreement will also tackle non-tariff barriers, think for instance on the type of lengthy procedures our producers have been facing in areas such, such as fruit export. Um, there will be as well a better opening of the Japanese services market. Uh, we include the specific chapters on issues such as corporate governance or small and medium-sized enterprises. Uh, we will increase the access of European companies to public procurement markets in Japan. Think of important, very important sectors such as railway. And we have increased the recognition of our IP, starting by iconic uh, and always at the center of discussion, geographical indications where there will be uh, 200 uh, GIs uh, recognizing Japan, but also in general by ensuring a level of protection of IP uh, that is fundamental for the type of goods and services that Europe sports, which are very much reliant on intellectual property. Uh, these are benefits for all of the European member states. Uh, obviously, I can, I can take an example, <coughs> taking into account where we are, uh, related to Germany. Uh, we do know that Japan is Germany's fifth biggest trade partner, exports to Japan almost 20 billion euros a year, and has a trade surplus of almost 4 billion euros. Uh, almost 12,500 German companies export to Japan, and actually 75% of such companies are SMEs. Um, this is quite interesting, and it's not only for SMEs in, in Germany. This is interesting for SMEs in, gen for SMEs in Germany, but for SMEs in general. Uh, they are often underrepresented in trade, and it is logical in a way uh, when you think of the type of difficulties they face. If you take, in particular, uh, markets that are as different to ours as Japan, for instance, uh, may be, uh, we're talking about very, very different languages, customs and marketing. All of these things are challenging for anyone, but in particular for small ones. Um, this is also part of what we've been trying to do with the Japan and what we try to include in our trade policy in general with the Japan Agreement, which is to lower the barriers for SMEs, to in particular conceive rules to support and make sure that these agreements can be of benefit for, in the end, the majority of exporters uh, to third countries. Uh, and as I was saying, this is not only for benefits of SMEs in Germany, it's a, for the benefit of SMEs uh, throughout the European Union. 99% of our businesses are SMEs. I have used Japan as an example, but uh, I could be giving examples of other member states, I could give, be giving examples of other trade agreements. As, as we speak, uh, products are being exported, if I continue with Germany, from Germany to third countries, whether it is uh, medical equipment and, and pianos from Leipzig to porcelain and printing, mach printing machine from Dresden, our office equipment from Nuremberg. Uh, they are going, whether it is to Japan, to Canada, to Mexico, to many other places. That's what we want to uh, uphold. That's what we want to help with our free trade agreements. But as I was saying, uh, we are not just looking at these agreements in economic terms or as means to maintain our place in the uh, global arena. We think they are also part of 
the way in which we can defend and enforce rules. And uh, this is something that we need to remind ourselves constantly today. We need to maintain trade which is based on rule and the respect for rules. Um, every agreement that we close is in a way a manner for us to tell our partners uh, that we can work to stand open to trade, shape globalization, and agree on rules that are fair and work for everybody. And these days, this is a very basic but important message when we are confronted with mounting tensions, uh, risks to the international system, uh, and a situation in general that may constitute a menace uh, to the system that has underwritten the prosperity that we have enjoyed for many years. Uh, and, and, and there it is important for me to enforce, to reiterate uh, the, the word enforcement. Uh, very often in the trade world you hear a lot about negotiations, you may hear less about enforcing, and by enforcement, enforcing I just don't mean taking cases to the WTO or having disputes. I'm talking about making sure that the rules we have negotiated and embedded in hundreds and hundreds of pages do in the end translate into a different reality. Uh, in other words, can be used by real companies, real people to reap the benefits of, of trade. Uh, implementation of our agreements is therefore crucial. And it is also crucial that we increasingly devote efforts to understand the effects of our agreements, the benefits they bring, but also, when necessary, the need to correct the consequences of our agreements, if there were to be negative uh, effects of some of them. This is, again, an area of work which uh, we think is very, very important to maintain the legitimacy of, of the system. Uh, now, uh, on, on the need to uphold a rules-based trade more in generally, and, and you've been talking about this uh, before, uh, we all see the threat uh, that is posed by unilateral actions taken by the US. We also understand that this is in part as well created by China playing these days a completely different role. Uh, and not having addressed a number of the issues that, in truth, distort the level playing field that uh, we will normally need to have fair trade uh, for all. Uh, we believe that, to a large extent, uh, the solution to the situation where we find ourselves now relies in the World Trade Organization. We continue to have a very active uh, bilateral engagement policy uh, in terms of challenges. Uh, we do not only engage bilaterally, but also we do cooperate on a trilateral basis. But in the end, uh, in our view, modernizing the WTO, allowing the WTO to give uh, the reply to a number of the questions we have now, uh, as pressing on the table is, is the way forward. The way forward if we want a system of trade which is for the benefit of all, not just a big, a few big players which one way or another, whether it is with the WTO or without it, will, allow, will manage to get, uh, to get their way through and, and impose a number of the conditions. Um, in that respect, and again, as, as I saw you were discussing in, in the prior panel, uh, we think that there are three very specific uh, objectives that need to be attained. Uh, one relates, as discussed, to the revival of the dispute settlement mechanism. And the second is the updating of the rules. And the third is improving the day-to-day -day work of, of the organization. Let me concentrate uh, a little bit on the updating of the, of the rules, because to, to some extent I saw you did discuss uh, quite a bit as regards the dispute settlement mechanism. Uh, the updating of the rules in the WTO, and this is something that 
is almost interesting that although we've been discussing, we've been discussing Doha for a long time, uh, it, it is only now that, that we start realizing uh, the extent to which we do need an update of, of some of those rules. Uh, we all know WTO created in 1995. At that point, we have 60 million users of the internet, so 0 0.5 percent of at the time uh, the world population whereas today we have half of the world's population uh, using internet 4.2 billion uh, a very very different membership of the organization uh, China Russia Saudi Arabia or Vietnam were no members uh, indeed even some of our own member states were not member at the time of the WTO uh, today, we have almost universal membership with 164 countries and 23 observer governments. Um, at the time, uh, the rules were largely uh, designed and agreed by a few members. Uh, today, uh, that is well gone, and uh, we have a process which is far more complex, but at the same, at the same time far more inclusive. All these are changes that should be welcome and should have been expected. There have been other changes that maybe were not as expected or many, uh, at least not as expected by all. Uh, back in 95, the economic models of those members that were in a way uh, driving the organization were quite uniform. Uh, we had similar systems and we play by similar rules. Uh, I think it is fair to say that today's membership is, is more diverse uh, and this is part of, of the challenge uh, and of the uh, discomfort in some of the discussions uh, we are having today. Uh, how can we fit uh, some very different players of quite large importance in the system that was designed uh, to work on the basis of an acceptance of common rules. Um, so clearly uh, we are using today rules that were conceived uh, for a while back uh, and it is clear in our view that uh, part of the solution to the problems that we are facing uh, besides the dispute resolution mechanism and the general functioning, the transparency and the, of the functioning of the organization, it has to be to allow WTO to set new rules where that is needed. And areas that are being discussed that you will hear often uh, relate to uh, subsidies, that's very clear, uh, forced technology transfer, uh, more in general, barriers to access for investment. If, if, if you think about it, uh, WTO has traditionally stayed within the area of, of, of goods and services, but, but not uh, investment in, in, in a larger sense. Uh, and e-commerce, that is also part of discussions that are ongoing. Any of these areas, even in normal times, present immense challenges. Uh, some of them because they are very, very difficult to address, take forced technology transfers. Others because they are relatively new and touch many different areas which are not necessarily always only trade related, take e-commerce. Uh, if they would have been complex under any circumstance, they are particularly complex today. And one of the things that uh, I think is, is becoming increasingly clear, and it was already to some extent acknowledged at the last ministerial conference in Buenos Aires a year ago, is that we need to agree to advance in a manner that doesn't require consensus. And that's why increasingly in the negotiations in Geneva, uh, you see countries engaging on the basis of what we will call a plurilateral open negotiation, uh, which I think uh, everybody understands may result in obligations that will need to be granted on an MFM basis. 
and this is uh, interesting. It is not necessarily uh, accepted by all the players, but I think what everybody agrees is that we do need to find a way to advance, even if some of the members of the organization don't want to do so or don't want to do so at this stage. Um, all these efforts uh, are part of a long process. You, you will tell me, yes, I mean, trade and WTO is always a long process. At the same time, I think there is a sense of urgency uh, and of a need for a political momentum on our side in that respect. The G7 and the G20 uh, will be, as well, uh, important players. We need political buy-in across the board. And that's probably one of the big challenges these days, is to get the political buy-in we need uh, from some of, of the big players. And you may have support by some players for some rules, but not for others. And the other way around, and, and, and you can put names of players and name on rules, is it, it gives you a sense of, of the complexity that, that we are facing. Uh, but it is clear we need uh, all of the main players involved. That includes China. Uh, China has greatly benefited from the WTO system, and as it was already by marketing uh, indicated in the last panel, China is probably among the members of the WTO that has the most to lose uh, if the system uh, crumbles. Um, it is an important uh, player in these discussions, and we are uh, making a very determined effort to, to have a dialogue with China and engage them in uh, the WTO reform or modernization discussions. Um, I will stop here. I mean, there are obvious things uh, that all of you know, but that I think sometimes uh, get forgotten in the political uh, discourse, sometimes including Europe these days. 90% uh, of global, grow global growth going forward will happen outside of the European Union. Uh, we have a few challenges of ourselves. Uh, there will be new technologies. Uh, we are facing a new geopolitic geopolitical situation. Uh, we have on top of that uh, Brexit. Uh, for us, it's very clear we need to focus uh, our action, and that includes, uh, as I said at the beginning of our intervention, maintaining the place of the European Union in the trade global arena, defending a system that is based on rules, and modernizing uh, the WTO. Uh, we think that should help ensuring the stability and the predictability that we need in what it is undeniably and is going to stay in all likelihood a increasingly complex reality. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much. I think we uh, we have something like uh, 15 minutes maybe for questions, if there are questions, and I'm quite sure there are. Gabriel. Thank you. I, I have many questions and not em enough time. But there's one thing that's, uh, that's, that has been on my mind for a long time. I've uh, done some work on uh, carbon leakage. Uh, so the fact that we not only face a global governance crisis in uh, trade, but also one uh, on uh, global warming. And the question is, where on the Commission's agenda is this issue? Uh, we have proposals like border tax adjustment uh, that, of course, have often feel a, a feel of protectionism with them, but they could create a level playing field uh, with countries who are not pursuing uh, the taxation of uh, carbon emissions. So that's that's my question. Thank you.
Yes, uh, Sebastian Jean, <coughs> I uh, would also have many questions, but I'll just ask you one um, uh, on uh, intellectual property, because uh, I know in addition that you're a specialist of this area. Um, I'm wondering, well, you've cited uh, uh, intellectual property rights as part of uh, the priorities on the, the EU trade policy agenda. What, a, what concretely do you see as uh, an object, uh, negotiation objective in that respect? What rules should be negotiated? Of course, we ha all have in mind in that respect China, but China has already been doing a lot to develop, to build from scratch a system of protection of intellectual property rights. Do you think they should do more? Or is that a question of uh, um, market access for investment, for, uh, for instance, of non-conditionality, of ending conditions such as joint venture or, or local and requirement. Um, yeah. Thank you. I would suggest we take one more question in this round, if that's mm -hmm. okay, and then we'll have another round. Please, over there. Good afternoon. My name is Pierre Gröning, representing Amphori, an association that uh, stands for Open and Sustainable Trade. We bring together about 2,300 uh, retailers and, and brand companies. I, I've unfortunately missed most of your speech, and I apologize for that, so hopefully my, my question is not touching upon issues that you've already covered. I have an important point which is about sustainability and, and how much kind of trade can promote sustainability um, through the different channels, not only trade agreements, but also uh, unilateral trade agreements, but also standards. And there's been increasing discussion about, um, let's say, exporting standards through trade policies, uh, kind of also when we look at um, the, the CETO emissions free trade, if we su uh, see kind of discussions about uh, certain commodities and how much kind of they have a sustainability impact on supply chains. So on the one hand, we very much support this because again, my association stands for open and sustainable trade. And we kind of have many other, I think, uh, industry associations that are supportive to that discussion, um, kind of European Union being a leader on promotion of sustainability standards. On the other side, we know that the rest of the world is not necessarily following that trend. Um, so there might be an, an issue of creating a discrepancy in terms of standard setting, um, the European Union, again, being a front runner, but maybe also being a lonely front runner. And so how much do you feel that others are following that kind of, let's say, call for more sustainability through trade? And how much do you fear maybe that there can be like a, an issue of creating barriers for other countries to enter the European market in the future? Thank you. Okay. Um. On, on, the, on the first point uh, as regards envirom environmental policy and, and how, how important uh, a role it plays in our trade policy, I would say that uh, today, clearly a very important role. Uh, already for a number of years, uh, the respect of rules related to the protection of the environment has been part of our trade and sustainable development chapters together with uh, labor related rules and and this is something that i think for now is acquired as a fundamental sine qua non part of our negotiated package with with her countries uh, politically even more I mean, the statements uh, taken very clearly by some of our political leaders as to uh, whether one should, one should engage in free trade negotiations with countries that are, for instance, not part of the Paris Agreement are there and, and, and are public and, and well known. I don't think we should create uh, environmental protection as a tool for gaining leverage or competitiveness by closing our markets. I just think we need to incorporate it as part of the principles we think need to exist in our trade, including internal trade and our trade with our countries. Um, on, on IP, uh, what is it that we need? And, and, and it's, it's, it's an interesting question because traditionally, when we have been talking about industrial property and trade, the discussion was about get into a certain level of protection, whether it is of uh, trademarks, patents, uh, copyright design or others, and then making sure that this level of protection is enforced. And normally the problems that we were trying to address were related mostly to uh, piracy, counterfeiting. Uh, the, 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 there's been traditionally other problems, for instance, bad quality patents or bad faith registration of trademarks, but but that was the more, if you want, uh, traditional approach. 
Um, and in that respect, th th there could be still some issues that can be improved in, in our FTAs. Um, for instance, as regards trade secrets, and I will get back to, to this in a second. These days, when we're talking about IP and trade, we're rather talking about the need to address forced technology transfer. Uh, and by that, we mean practices that will put our companies in a situation where without them wanting to do so, they end up disclosing their IP. Uh, and with that, by IP, I include indeed trade secret and other sensitive, important commercial information that makes a company competitive in a particular, um, in a particular market. Um, and that is a situation that indeed we need to address, maybe to some extent by the standards of protection. I'll give you an example in terms of trade secrets. It's all well to say you need to have a proper uh, protection of trade secrets in your jurisdiction, but we might need to be more specific and say, for instance, uh, no party should be forced to uh, disclose uh, the protected information in the course of action taken in front of an administrative or, or a judicial authority, uh, which is a situation that our companies face uh, in, in a number of countries. Uh, so you can improve the protection of trade secret, but what we rather need as well to do, or what we also need to do, is look at those rules we need to avoid our companies being in a situation where their IP is vulnerable. And that indeed uh, is more related to barriers to investment in the sense of barriers to impose uh, or conditions imposed on companies to ac access a market. Think of uh, joint ventures, compulsory joint ventures, or equity caps, a max that you can have in terms of the equity you own in an investment and therefore forces you to uh, partner up with a domestic firm. It also relates to the need to improve the situation of our companies, not just when they are trying to access the market, but also when they are in the market. A lot of the leakage of our IP happens when they are trying to get the required authorization, whether it is to start a plant to produce a particular product, or whether it is to be able to put a particular product in the market because they require, as it is normal, uh, for some products to, to, to have the products accredited. Um, those are uh, rules, both those affecting the access to the markets and those affecting the functioning in the market, which are far more difficult to, to craft. Uh, because also very often it's difficult to make them totally objective. You can address some of these problems by having domestic regulation improvements, by having uh, commitments in our trade agreements to better regulations. Say, for instance, authorizations need to be based on objective requirements that, that can be uh, that are known in advance, that can be appealed, etc., etc., etc. All these things are fine, uh, and. In th certain markets, if you have those rules on the book, you hope that most of the time it works. In other markets, it's very, very difficult to ensure that they work. Uh, our companies complain in countries like China of a big problem, increasing problem with forced technology transfer. Uh, it's very difficult uh, to prove that sometimes. It is very often that European negotiators are confronted with comments such as, we do not force technology transfer. We don't have such requirement in our law shows the problem. So that is, uh, that, that is part of the discussion on, on, on IP and forced technology transfer. But you're right, it goes more towards uh, rules on market access and, and treatment once you're in the market than on the standards of IP protection. Uh, on, on the supporting of our standards and whether we're going to be leaders, <coughs> or lonely leaders, it's not necessarily, it's not necessarily a, a new problem. Standards have always been a race to, uh, to being leaders in particular markets or uh, technologies. In the past, we have managed uh, sometimes to cooperate, sometimes not to cooperate. 
I mean, standards was one of the big discussions at the time of, of the TPP. They continue to be a, a big part of our discussions uh, in many negotiations these days. Uh, regulatory cooperation is very important. Uh, but it is correct that today we, we have the other complexity that a big standard setter will be China, is China. Uh, and, and how is that going to work? Uh, in terms of are we going to be aligning with, are we going to be cooperating? If we cooperate with one party, are we them in a position where we cannot cooperate with another big jurisdiction? Uh, that is a very good question that uh, I do not at this moment have uh, a clear reply to. Thank you. I, I think we can do maybe three more questions. One. Uh, Gerhard Stahl, Peking University HSBC Business School. I have a simple question. In the last uh, EU-China summit in July, it was the 20s, there was in the joint declaration quite a positive and ambitious text uh, to achieve progress in the comprehensive investment agreement, which is ne negotiated already since years between China uh, and the European Union. And I think it was already mentioned today that we have around 60 working parties where experts of the EU and China are sitting together to discuss all different types of, of questions. My simple question to you is, can you already comment whether there are some progress made uh, in light of this ambitious uh, declaration? And do you have any feeling about the timing of these uh, negotiations? Simon Evenet again from St. Gallen. Uh, I too have a simple question. Um, in what way is your thinking about how to deal with the Americans today influenced by the unilateralism that the Americans showed towards Japan in the 1980s and 90s and the impact of that unilateralism on the GATT and then the Uruguay round? I'd be very interested to see what, if any, parallels you have drawn between these two episodes. Stefano Schiavo from the University of Trento. Um, we have been hearing today about this twin uh, strategy of pushing for bilateral um, agreements and also trying to save or to rescue the role of the WTO. I wonder whether you see any conflict between possibly these two, right? Uh, whether pushing for bilateral negotiations and, and agreements may undermine the role of the, of the WTO. Mm. Yep. Um, on, on, on the first question, uh, yes, to the extent I can, I can give you an answer. I'm, I'm the EU, EU chief negotiator in our investment negotiations with China. Um, so, uh, and they have been ongoing for a while, but I can, I can think of quite a few negotiations that have been ongoing for longer. Um, positive outcome in, in the summit, that is uh, correct in terms of the declarations. Also there was a commitment which, which was indeed uh, realized to, to do a first exchange of uh, market access offers. Uh, we are talking, just, just uh, in case it's not clear uh, for everybody, we're talking about an agreement uh, that is being negotiated with China that is it's not a free trade agreement. Uh, this was a political discussion that took place a number of years ago where the Union said to China, let's, let's see if we can work together by first having a bilateral investment agreement, which is a rather comprehensive agreement uh, because unlike the investment agreements that our member states normally have, it does not only contain uh, protection of investment and dispute resolution, but it does contain a number of other things, including investment and sustainable development, including rules of uh, on competition, rules on SOE, and market access. Uh, so that gives you an idea when, when I mention some of these issues and, and, and you realize we're negotiating with China, that gives you an idea of the complexity of the, of the negotiations and why I say three years may not be that long. Uh, nevertheless, uh, it is correct that there's been more engagement on the uh, Chinese side. But it is also correct to say that we will need far more engagement in order uh, 
uh, to have a progress that will allow us to say yes, uh, we are within reach of a a satisfactory outcome that then the Commission will be comfortable to say this is a deal worth having and worth uh, presenting to uh, Member States and the European Parliament. We are not yet there. Uh, I think that is as much as, as I can say. Um, as regards the second simple question, simple questions are always the worst. Normally when, person, when people say to you, I'm going to put to you a simple question, means, look, this is very difficult, and you're right. And I will not pretend, uh, I will not pretend to tell you that, uh, yes, we've been looking into a, every single possible uh, angle uh, of parallelism between what was going on uh, between the US and uh, Japan at the time and what's going on between the US and, and China. And I'm not a foreign policy expert, but on a very simple uh, manner, it seems to me uh, that the parallelisms maybe are not that relevant. And uh, as mighty as Japan uh, is as an economy, as, as much of a threat as it was felt at the time, I will say that China is a completely different challenge, not only in terms of the size of the population and the economy, but also of, of, of the paradox that it puts on the table, which is someone that is going to be competing with you there in the international sphere, but on different rules to some extent. And that, that is a problem that I think uh, we did not have to the same degree, thirdly, with Japan. Uh, bilateral, multilateral, that is a very good question. In an ideal world, we will only do multilateral. And then we will be constantly updating the rules of the game, so we will all constantly be having a very clear and neat uh, rule book and some of the horrendous problems that many of our traders face today, even trying to determine rules of origin, will be much simpler and we will all live in a much better world. Um, and everyone will be in Geneva all the time rather than flying around. <laughs> I think that is gone a long time ago. I, I think that uh, to keep pace with, with the ambition that we have in terms of um, not only market access for goods and services, but also in terms of rules, in terms of uh, a number of the values we want to inject in, in our trade agreements, uh, it will be difficult to, to have that push, push solely on the basis of, of uh, multilateral. I think what you're seeing now, and that is really interesting, is the emergence of the mega regionals. So uh, it is things like the CPTPP, that we are trying to remember how to say the name, or, or USMCA. Uh, those are the big. Uh, the type of agreements we have concluded with Japan, with Singapore, with Vietnam, if you look at that, there is a template as well. And for us, clearly, it's a template for our relations with ASEAN. So that is where you may start having a convergence of rule, which is probably a second best to a multilateral. And obviously, we'll be very happy to be able to have a number of those rules at multilateral level and willing and engaged to work in that direction. But uh, in the meantime, we need to keep going. So I think the bilateral and regional is, is going to stay there. Can I, uh, can I to, to wrap up, can I ask a completely different question, which is related to uh, Brexit, one of the big and chaotic themes of these days. Uh, so, um, you know, in, the, in this debate, one thing that is on the table is a customs union uh, with the United Kingdom, or at least with Northern Ireland. We, we don't know how long it's going to last. One argument that has come up, and there I would be very interested in well, how you think about this, one argument that has come up is that uh, anything like customs unions ar union arrangement with the UK could not just be a problem for UK flexibility in trade policy, but also for the EU. So if the EU intends to have future trade deals with whoever it is, uh, could it be the case that this Brexit uh, contract may become a problem, meaning uh, the EU depending on finding some kind of agreement with the UK on future trade policy, de policy deals? Or would you say that's, that's a non-issue? 
I will say that's an issue. I'm not going to take a position at this stage. Okay, that's what. And I I'm not sure you expected me to take a position. Okay, okay. No, that's. I was afraid you might, but I thought I, I should <laughs> still try. Anyway, thank you very much for this presentation <laughs> and for the discussion. Thanks to you all, and please be back at um, what is it? A quarter to five, in half an hour, uh, we will have this wonderful panel about the new protectionism. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.